Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about the Apple Breeding Program um, and, and the progress that we've been making. So I'm Kate Evans. I'm based in the Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center in Wenatchee. Um, and I've been leading the Apple Breeding Program for WSU for just over six years now. So when we're talking about uh, success in, in the apple business, uh, the choice of the variety is essential. Um, and let's face it, you've got a lot of opportunities, a lot of things to choose from right now. But you need to think about a whole load of different important elements when you're choosing which variety it is that you're going to plant. Let me take this out. Okay, that might help. And so the, the main need that I came up with when I was sort of analyzing this really is that what we're looking for is to plant a variety that will produce a consistently good quality product for the consumer all year round. And so not only does that quality need to be consistent at, at harvest, but any new variety has to be able to be handled well so it doesn't fail on the packing line. And it has to store well. Because fundamentally, you know, you guys are producing such a big crop now that we've got to be able to keep that quality all the way through the year. And then a few other things that are important to consider when you're looking at a new variety are uh, tree structure. I mean, can we grow it in different growing systems? How amenable is the variety to the growing system of your choice? What about crop load? Is it easy to thin? Is it going to be expensive to thin? And then how long's the harvest window? I mean, how flexible is that going to be for you? Do you have to wait for color? Can we pick it once? Do you have to pick it more than once? Is it going to be really expensive to pick? And what is the pack out? Because fundamentally, if you haven't got a new variety that's got a decent level of pack out, it's just going to, there's just money going down the drain for you. So how have we attempted to meet these demands in the breeding program? Um, and when I kind of stopped and tried to think about this, you know, really it's what we've been doing is we've been using some new precision techniques. So the apple breeding program is not static. We evolve the techniques that we're using all the time. We take in techniques from other projects. We collaborate with a lot of projects to help develop new techniques to really improve the precision that we're using in the program. So what I've tried to do is to sort of summarize this into four different steps. Okay, so the first step in our precision breeding, and this really has made a huge difference in our breeding, is DNA-informed choice of parents. So what do I mean by that? When you're doing breeding, the first thing you've got to do once you've chosen your targets, and we've got our target now of consistent good fruit quality and all of those other things I talked about, we have to choose the parents, the optimum parents, that if we make the, that cross between those parents, we've got a high likelihood of getting seedlings and new varieties out of that cross that will have the quality traits that we want. But how do we do that with just the knowledge that we have in terms of the phenotype or the appearance or the characteristics of those apples? We've been doing that fairly successfully for several hundred years now. However, what we can do with the new techniques we have, uh, such as the DNA-informed breeding, we can really be so much more precise in our choice. So when I'm talking about DNA-informed breeding, I'm talking about using sort of the DNA fingerprinting techniques that we all see on CSI and all of those kind of shows. But not only do they enable us to tell the difference between different varieties, but they also help us to tell a little bit about what characteristics those varieties have got. So now we have some tools, some DNA tools, that will help us to distinguish uh, varieties for all of these different characteristics. And what it enables us to do when we're making our decision about which individuals to cross in the first place is to make a really a much more informed cross, a much more precise choice about that very first decision in the breeding program. The second step in our precise breeding is DNA-informed selection of seedlings. And this is taking the same kind of technique. It's using the, the DNA fingerprinting type technique to look at seedlings at a very early stage and to identify the ones that have got the least potential to be good. 
Okay, so what we can do is take a very small piece of leaf tissue from our seedling, and, and these seedlings are about two weeks old, um, and we can screen it with these the DNA tools that we have, and we can discard or reject any seedlings that really just aren't going to make it. To give you an idea of numbers, last year we screened almost 9,000 seedlings using this technique and we threw away just over half of them. If we'd have kept those seedlings in the ground um, or in the greenhouse, we'd have had to propagate them on, plant them out in the orchard, and it would have cost us uh, thousands of dollars to have taken them through to the point where we could actually look at fruit on the tree to most likely make that very same decision that we're actually going to discard those seedlings. So using this technique has enabled us to be more precise, but also to save dollars. The third step in our precision is the, the extensive evaluation of the fruit that we do. Now, Des already talked a little bit about the videos, and if anybody here was one of my, what was it, 218 hits that we had on the website, yay. Um, uh, uh, then you'll, see, you'll have seen the day in the life of the, the apple breeder in the lab, but uh, if you haven't seen it yet, um, just, just take a look and uh, it'll give you an idea of the, the, the large range of instrumental tests that we do on all of the fruit that we bring in, um, some of it at harvest, but all of it after two and four months of storage, uh, and, uh, and the sensory analysis that we do on that fruit can be a little tortuous at times, but uh, it, it gets some good results. And what we've also been doing is including more uh, new techniques in this evaluation, so some more precision testing. We're routinely using uh, a, a, a more digitest. It's a little more complex than a standard penetrometer. It gives us more information about texture. Um, and this is the, the DA meter that Stefano was talking about that helps us to have an understanding of the maturity of the individual. So we're really trying to be um, very up, up to date with any new techniques that are coming in in terms of fruit evaluation and to try them out in the program really to see if it's going to help us to identify the, the better individuals. And then ultimately, the fourth step in the precision breeding has to be the extensive evaluation that we do on the selections as a whole. Uh, we have uh, a lot of field plantings, a lot of grower site plantings. Hopefully many of you will have, have visited those. Um, obviously we, we're doing packing line testing, we're doing waxing. And then um, again, as Stefano mentioned, we have a systems and rootstock trial with 38. We're really trying to sort of push the boundaries on, on producing information about the new varieties that we're releasing. And that also moves into the whole area of consumer testing as well. I think we've done a, a lot more consumer testing, um, certainly in the last couple of years, than we'd ever done before. So have we made any progress in this precision breeding for Washington? Um, well, yes. I, I mean, obviously, that's my view. <laughs> Um, but I hope you'll agree. Uh, what I'm going to do now is just talk about Cosmic Chris specific, specifically, uh, or WA38, in terms of um, how it fits into those categories that I listed at the beginning as essential for a new variety. So first of all, the tree structure. Uh, the systems trial, is, as Stefano mentioned, is looking promising. We're getting a whole load of data on that. Um, and as he said, by the time we get trees out to the industry, there will be a whole lot of information that's, that's, that's available to enable you to, to, grow, uh, to grow it effectively. It seems to thin pretty well to, th to singles. It's not a, not a difficult variety to thin. Um, from our data so far, it looks as if you could harvest it in one to two picks. Um, this is just an illustration of a, a couple of picks a week apart uh, from a few years ago now, but showing a fairly consistent in terms of maturity. Uh, we're doing a lot more work this current season in terms of looking at, at strip picks and really seeing if we can get it down to a one pick variety. It handles really well on a commercial line. It's now standardly part of our testing. Uh, it's been through a generic Granny Smith run. Uh, it Wax is fine, no problems there. Really high pack out. 
And we see really good storage potential, both with or without 1MCP. And the big thing about it is its consistent texture. Uh, this was some data that we got from March last year, where we compared CA stored 38 or Cosmic Crisp with CA stored 1MCP treated Honeycrisp. Uh, this is a consumer preference test in, in Spokane. Um, consumers were asked to rate uh, Honeycrisp, which is the red bar versus 38, the blue bar for appearance, taste, flavor, texture, and then overall preference. And you can see that for everything except appearance, which was pretty much the same for the two of them, uh, the 38 outperformed the, the Honeycrisp. We also, I should say, we also performed this test in October and December, and we had, a, a, it was a much more even footing, but it really, I think the point of moving it into March shows you just how well the, the 38 was storing. And of course, you can't do all of this without having an apple that's got excellent eating quality. So, you know, we can, we can do all of this testing, but if it doesn't really eat well and we haven't got excited consumers, um, we're not going to be successful. So where are we in terms of Cosmic Crisp right now? There, were, uh, there are 300,000 buds that have been allocated through the drawing that we had in WSU last year. They've all been allocated, the growers that uh, were successful in the drawing all know who they are and, and that all went out in the good fruit grower. Uh, hopefully there are enough rootstocks for those trees to be budded and uh, they will then be available for planting in 2017. Uh, the latest I heard was that, that we were doing pretty well in getting the, the growers with the buds lined up with the nurseries with the rootstocks, so um, that's reassuring. And then beyond 2017, there will be no restrictions on the orders. So there have been a bit of confusion about that. People have seemed to think that we will be continuing this drawing process about availability of buds. That's not the case. We fully expect that uh, beyond 2017, uh, it'll be up to, up to growers to just go order a tree with a nursery like any other tree. And then there are no restrictions on which Washington nursery to use. We've, we've really tried to get it out there as much as possible into um, as many nurseries as we could. The choice of the packer and the marketer is up to the grower, but there will be a, a unified brand name development. So we kind of felt it was important. We've got a trademark name now. We need to have some unification in the messaging that goes out to consumers about the, the fruit and it will be in Washington only for 10 years. So Washington will have the head start in terms of, uh, of getting it out there and hopefully making some, some decent returns. So just a few uh, things to look out for in the future. We will have a fruit sampling uh, of Cosmic Crisp and probably also WA2 on March the 6th at 10 a.m. at the Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center in Wenatchee. So if you wanna see what it's like, come and taste some, please join us at that point. Uh, we'll also plan to have a, a couple of sessions in August. We'll do Wenatchee and Yakima, I expect, where we'll report out on the previous season's storage, but there'll be fruit to, to taste. And then, of course, we'll do field days again in September. So look out for those. We'll try and get the information out uh, ahead of time with a bit of advance notice. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of conclude, um, you know, we, we, we know that orchard systems and equipment are really being developed for precision horticulture, um, but it's really important to think about the, the new varieties that you include in that. Um, and I think uh, it's fair to say that the breeding techniques, the precision breeding techniques that we're using here at WSU are really helping to produce new improved varieties for Washington. So I just want to acknowledge uh, all of the collaborators in the team uh, couldn't do the work without them, and obviously uh, funding sources as well. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>